I am here on this platform after many moons. I was here, I think, about 10 years ago for the same fest. And I have great memories of that morning. It was a wonderful morning. A very receptive audience, a very warm hospitality of Anil Dharkar. I miss him greatly. The entire ambience was so good. So when I received a phone call from Kwasar, I jumped on it and he said, yes, I'm coming. And then in one of his mails, he asked me what the topic of my presentation will be. And off the cuff, I said, well, time and space in art, theater. It was later on I realized that I had put myself into a very tight spot. It's a vast subject. And it has been dealt with so many times for umpteen numbers of years. Ever since art was born, people have been talking about art, space, time together. And no final answer has been found yet. And I, a small, a small person who has dabbled in art for, say, four decades or five decades, trying to do it as rather presumptuous, but I'll try. Uh, my lecture will have two segments. The first segment is, but I mean, completely technical. Uh, as a playwright, I will tell you how I dealt with, or rather, how I discovered space and time in theater, how I negotiated with these two elements. And uh, um, uh, how it is absolutely necessary for a playwright to know this so that he doesn't falter if he wants to be a good playwright. It doesn't really mean that I claim to be a good playwright, but well, that is the basic rule. So I will begin with some personal mythology. Uh, I must tell you that there will be uh, a lot of I, 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 and me, 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 and mine, mine, mine in my lecture. Uh, it's true that I'm a narcissist, but well, it is inevitable because I will be talking to you about my experiences. I am not entering the arena of arid academic intellectual discussion. That is not my forte. I don't have the intellectual rigor and analyze what theater is in an abstract manner. Sorry. But uh, I can tell you my experiences, how I negotiated with certain problems, and where it took me from one point to another, it has been a long trajectory. So the first part is uh, how I discovered theater to begin with. I lived in Nagpur and uh, I had no plans in my life, no, no plans for future. I had decided only on one thing. I had charted a career of doing nothing. And it's a very difficult career. It's very challenging. Try it. You will not succeed. But I almost succeeded it. And it's because I think it was a kind of rebellion. My father wanted me to be a civil servant or something, you know. And because my father said so, I decided that I will not do that. You know, it's a typical father-son relationship. So I was spending my time traveling, reading, teaching. And because I was a college teacher, I had a lot of time. And I spent most of time in my garden, Jula, looking at the horizon, and I was perfectly happy. And uh, I didn't know why people have been running after so many things when you are perfectly happy doing nothing. And then a terrible accident happened. I went to see a play written by Tendulkar and uh, directed by Vijaya, by, and she acted in it. And that changed my life. I saw the play and I was completely electrified and I didn't understand what was happening. I mean, I kept wondering, one minute Dr. Lago and Vijay Bhai are in this corner and the next minute I see somewhere there, what's happening on the stage? So I said, my, I think this is really technical, I think. So I went and saw that play again. And then, uh, as my friend tells me, I have a savage confidence, you know. 
I said, well, I, I can write one play. No problem. I'll write one. And so I wrote a play. And just kept it in my desk. A friend came over. She read it. And she said, well, it's good material. So I sent it to Bhagavat. And he published it. And Bhagavat wrote me saying that you, some, you must write some more. So I wrote. I, it was not a problem. And then within 18 months of my writing my first play, Sultan, Vijay Bhai wrote me saying that she wanted to do those plays, Sultan and Holy, for her Rangayan workshop. And uh, I said, yes, no problem. I mean, as if, I, as if it was bound to happen, you know. Then I came here, met Vijay Bhai, and people had told me that uh, she's a beautiful woman and very sophisticated. You have to talk to her in English. So I composed uh, a few smart sentences in English, checked my grammar, and approached her with a lot of bravado. And I am Mahesh Elkujar. She said, Madho, hi, Leko Kala, that kind of a thing. <laughs> so all my bravado collapsed. And I started eating out of her hands within five minutes. She doesn't know what she has done to my life. You know, it, it began from that moment. She's a beautiful woman. She's worse. So <laughs> it began from there. And uh, we worked very closely. I mean, not, we did not meet much often because I live in Nagpur. But whenever I came, we sp spent some time together. She would come over to Nagpur during her tours. And she always stayed with me. And... When we sat down to talk, it was not because we were intellectually interested in art or it was not an academic talk. We were sharing, you know, like two artists do. And they were not very long conversations, punctuated by many silences, fun. But one learned a lot. You know, in theater, there is no guru shishya tradition as it is in music or dance. I consider her my teacher. She doesn't. She has never said that I'm anybody's teacher. You know, she is very democratic that way. Uh, I learned a lot. You know, in theater, you either learn or perish. Simple. Nobody teaches you. So that is how I picked up a few things. And once she was telling me, within the first year or two, maybe, Mahesh, uh, you don't really use space properly. What you see on stage is because of me. I move your characters from this point to that point or at that point. And you, you have only two characters on stage usually. All my plays at that time were like that, only two characters or three characters at the most. And you don't make them use the space. And I said, oh, yes, that is true. There is one thing. Instinctively, I am a playwright. I never felt like writing anything else. And I used to see a play happening in a particular space, even when I wrote, you know. I knew it's happening there, and the character standing on stage. I saw the stage. If you do not, you are not a playwright. A lot of people come to me, young people, who say that, well, I have a beautiful story, sir, and I want to dramatize it. And I say, don't do it. The story is born as a story. Why do you want to change the narrative, you know? If you want to write a play, then you have to see something as a regular play. But when Bai pointed out to me uh, the existence of space in theater and how uh, everybody has to relate to it, the actor, the director, and the playwright also. In fact, the playwright should be clever enough to use that space in such a manner that he does not leave any work left for the director or the actors. Everything is beautifully arranged, if he's a clever playwright. It does not mean the directors don't change. They always do, because otherwise they will not prove their uh, importance. So I said, I will write, I will do this by And then I decided to people this stage, let's say 40 by 30 something. I decided to people it with uh, 12 characters. I said, why not 12? Why two? Now, how can I get 12 characters together? It was an exercise. I didn't mean to write a play for performance. Since I have a lot of time in Nagpur, you know, so much time, I can play these games. It's fun. 
So I said, if he's going to be a party in Mumbai and there will be 12 characters and well, one is Mohini, one is Barve, one is this, one is that. So I brought some colored buttons, drew a map of stage and put those colored buttons on the map. And I started moving them from here to there. I started what they call compositions, you know. It, I was having great fun and I could see the characters moving, circulating, interacting, avoiding each other. And this was a revelation for me. I said, oh God, that is how this theatrical space is used. And it's great fun and I have to know this. If I have to, if I know how I connect myself as a playwright to the space, how my characters connect to the space, how my characters connect each other with space in between them. I mean, there are many, many dimensions to it. And you have to perceive them before you even put your pen down to your paper. It is a sort of education, and it is primary education. You know, anybody who writes a play has to learn these basics. Otherwise, you will never be able to write even a manageable play. So, I started playing it, and it was great fun. And after I finished, that was uh, the play was party. I said, "Well, I must read it out because there are uh, um, uh, sort of uh, there is English spoken, bad English spoken." Uh, um, uh, variety of Marathi, etc., etc. So I said, well, I must read it out to myself. And when I read it out myself, I realized that, well, there is something else. Till then, I was aware only of visual space on stage. That is a physical space, visual space. But there is another space, and that is acoustic space. And that is very important. Acoustic space is the dialogue which you hear, the lay, the rhythm of the dialogue, how it is spoken, how many pauses in the dialogue. I discovered pauses during the writing of party, and I, you know it is funny. I should not spill out all the all the tricks one learns, but I don't mind. It's a family, so it's all right. It's safe. Don't tell them uh, about this. Uh, I was stuck when I was writing party, and uh, I didn't know. I mean, there was a line of dialogue, and I said, my God, what do I write next? So I really write pause, and uh, went back to my work. And after some time, I came, and uh, I said, what's nonsense? So I read, this is nonsense, went back. I read the whole stuff in the evening, and I said, my God. This character says, uh, what's happening, I don't know, and pause. And the other character, after this pause, comes and says, that's nonsense, and this pause is so loaded. You can interpret this pause in so many ways. And different actors would interpret this pause in so many different ways, and they would go on uh, adding meanings to this pause, to these characters, to the ambience of the play. A pause is a very important thing. Good playwrights, use pauses instinctively. They have to learn the art, so sometimes pauses are used deliberately as a matter of craft, but sometimes they occur uh, because you are very much with your team and you pause and the characters also pause. So acoustic space, although not seen, you know, have to be aware of it. That also is a physical space. During that time, Vada Cheribandi was in um, rehearsal, and I came over, and I was talking to Bai, and I said, well, Bai, the, between two scenes, there is darkness, and there is music. I don't like that music. There should be silence. And she said, there is no silence in theater, Mahesh. There is no silence. Silence is the end. There are pauses. I brooded over it and I realized that, yes, what she says is true. There is nothing like silence, not in the only in theater, in our lives. People want silence and it's just not possible to find a silence anywhere. It is a very, uh, what should I say, unrealistic demand to expect silence either in our real life or in our personal lives. There is no silence. Because 
what happens is, I'll come to that silence uh, thing later on. First, we are coming back to the space. What happens is, you can't, right? What happens is when uh, a playwright is not sure of uh, how he is using the space, both acoustic and physical space, visual space, he goes on cluttering up the stage and he goes on cluttering up the dialogue also. He overwrites. He clutters up stage. He goes on giving instructions. A lamp there, a side table there. I mean, he uh, mentions all the property also. So much so that there is hardly any space for the move, <laughs> actors to move. The first thing is to declutter, make it simpler, make it sparse, make it really spartan. And so also in dialogue. What they are going to keep on the stage is not a playwright's problem, it is the problem of the director and the actors. But you can look after the acoustic space and decide that your dialogue has to be very sparse and very um, economical so that <clears throat> it is not cluttering up the entire uh, acoustic space. And often many uh, beginners, novices, they begin to write uh, dialogue, which is, in fact, they write conversation. It doesn't ring like dialogue. They forget that dialogue in theatre is always artificial. Every single word is written carefully, knowing how it sounds, knowing how it would work, whether it thunders on the ears of other actors and uh, audience or where it is spoken softly. So, dialogue is always artificial. It is never conversation, although dialogue has to sound like conversation. Once this is taken care of, then, well, uh, you have learned the basics of these two spaces. Uh, another, I have talked about space. I have not talked about time. Time is not, in fact, a fourth dimension. It was Einstein who said, Time is a fourth dimension after his theory of relativity. So a space is three-dimensional, but now we shall add time also. Time is important in stay in theater, very much practically and artistically also. I can write a 700 uh, pages novel, I can write 1,000 page, I mean 1, pages novel, I mean there is no uh, restriction on me, but a play has to be over within 90 minutes, 120 minutes. I'm given a time limit. And I have to show everything in those 90 minutes. I have to show Mahabharata in 90 minutes. I have to show the collapse of civilization, a birth of new civilization in those 90 minutes in this small 40 by 35 space. Physically and acoustically, I'm completely restrained I have to show big things in a very small space, in a very short period of time. That is a big challenge. The restrictions can become a challenge. That is where you learn to be innovative. If there are no restrictions, you wouldn't bother about innovation. You can tell things simply. Now, when I started thinking about time and space together as a single unit, I was wondering how uh, other artists approach this problem. Do they have a problem with this and how, they, how do they approach it? I think any writer, any actor, any director, any painter, any musician must have a dialogue with people coming from other arts. Otherwise, you remain a very incomplete person. Whether it helps you in your pursuit of art is irrelevant here. As a human being, it's better to know a variety of people coming from a variety of disciplines. It is so enriching, and if you are really enriched, it is reflected. It is reflected in your work. So I said, how do musicians approach uh, space and time? We all know how Kumarji used to leave his dance unfinished, and there was uh, a pause of, say, five seconds, and we completed that tan within ourselves, etc. 
this is talked about so much that is different but there are more intriguing ways the weight space and time are used in music i i have this habit of counting matras you know i mean ek tal 12 matras jhumra 14 matras i i was not groomed in music but i have been listening to music ever since i was born there was a concert on the day i was born in my house yeah that is what my father told me and my brother was an accomplished singer so one was sort of groomed i have this habit and i have some old collection of uh, records 75 rmp and i was listening to mogubai kurdikar starana in bageshri and i started counting and it is in three tal 16 beats and i always came late by one beat on the sum i said it never happens to me why am i am i coming late on the sum by a beat you know saying that mogubai doesn't know tal is is a sacrilege i said there is something wrong with me or maybe the um, rpm is defective but once doctor a uh, no doctor uh, um, pandit suresh talwalkar was over at my place in nagpur and i said pandit ji i have a problem this particular tarana in bageshi i can't count the beats you know i am always late by one beat is it oh, that tarana it is trital yes but it is not 16 matras this is 15 and a half matras साढ़े पंद्रह मात्रा ऐसे हाउ डू यू काउंट एम इज यू काउंट थर्टी वन यू हैव टू चेंज द लय इंस्टेड ऑफ सेंग वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स सेवन एट यू से वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स सेवन एट लाइक दैट एंड आई काउंटेड एंड आई वॉज ऑन द स्पॉट यू नो दिस इज एंट्री गाइज इट माई गॉड दिस स्पेस फ्रॉम वन सम टू अनदर सम दिस स्पेस हाउ इज इट फिल्ड बाय टाइम बाय मात्राज यू नो this is amazing this is intriguing and it requires a tremendous amount of expertise that also opened me to the way time and space are used in other arts i became a more uh, conscious uh, listener a more conscious viewer when i look at paintings when it comes to paintings i think marathis are blind to paintings you know we don't have um, what should i say an impulsive response to paintings we are not groomed that way but then prabhakar kolte and uh, patrodhan groomed me sort of way i used to meet raza also whenever he came to nagpur because he spent his adolescence in nagpur with atle guruji so we met through our three times and he used to talk to him i, I was like you know puppy asking him questions and he was so patient with me then i met uh, akbar we were together in baroda for 7 days and and he because he knows sanskrit we could go back to our scriptures and he explained a lot of things to me so since then i think i am sort of semi groomed when it comes to paintings now once i arrived at this particular point knowing what space and time are in theater in other arts and a moment come came in my life when i realized that i am very unhappy with my writing i found it rather what should i say green hornish it is nothing original it is not saying what i want to say it is not a reflection of what i am feeling what do i want to do and i realized that whenever i come in the company of great art i know nobody has to tell me it is great art i know because somewhere there is always a moment when you are experiencing the art i am not saying understanding the art understanding is a cerebral activity experiencing it very important so when you are experiencing it you realize there is always a moment when you know that the medium and the performer have transcended at least momentarily the barriers of space and time there is an indefinable territory of experiences indescribable territory of experiences it cannot be named because what happens there is unnameable 
Initially, it is full of primal feeling that cannot be expressed in words. But sometimes music reaches there. I have had a long talk with Bayu also about the nature of language. And I always feel that uh, we writers, it's not only, I write essays also, so I know. Uh, I think music is a better idiom to reach that realm of experiences. After the experiences, there is another thing. I'll come to that later on. But uh, I can't transcend time and space in my writing because I'm completely shackled by time and space. Because my mind is structured in such a way that it cannot unshackle itself, one. And secondly, the tool I use is uh, language. Now, language is a product of intelligence. And we may be egotistical about our intelligence, but it is limited. And since the language is a product of intelligence, it can go to a particular point where intelligence stops and language stops. It cannot go beyond that. That is one thing. It's a product of human intelligence. And secondly, we have abused it so much. We have misused our language so much. Overuse, contaminated language, then uh, the burden of historicity on it, the accumulation of so many meanings to one single word. Wittgenstein has said a lot of things about it. You know. So also Chomsky. All these are great detriments. While music is, you know, Shuddha uh, Nishad is Shuddha Nishad, nothing else. Nothing is attached to a nishad. Rishab is rishab. Nothing is attached. It's the purest medium. And that is why with the help of purest medium, you can go a bit higher than the people who do not use such pure idioms. That is my personal uh, experience or that is my personal opinion. You can disagree with it. Let me make it uh, very clear to you right now that I have not arrived at any definite conclusions in my life. I'm in a constant state of flux. I don't have opinions. I don't have hypothesis about anything. I go with the flow and every day I'm a different person, which is considered rather, uh, um, what, what should I say, juvenile by some of my friends. You have to have firm opinions, you know. You have to have an ideal and reach there. But the problem is whether in life or whether in uh, literature, whether in arts, if you fix an ideal, it's already decided. You just find ways to reach there. And once you reach there, you have nothing else to do. You bypass life. I would rather not be an artist, you know, I would rather live a full life. So, I realized that I cannot uh, go to that territory, indefinable territory, and when I say there is something above the transient uh, world of emotions and even primal feelings, there is something which is absolutely immovable and silent, and that is the absolute. I am not being spiritual. I am not at all a spiritual person. And I am the last person to be religious. This is not religion. It's not uh, even spirituality. It is a basic thing, you know. You can see. It is there. The absolute is there. Everything has come out of it. Everything will go into that. And the absolute is impersonal. It has nothing to do with you, although we have something to do with that. It is a one-way thing. So, and this has been reflected in arts all over the world, you know. We take painting, take music, take literature, persons like T.S. Eliot and Emily Dickinson, and uh, so many, so many, particularly Emily Dickinson goes on talking about eternity, you know. Continuously, that's her obsession. What is that? Um, I've forgotten the lines. Exultation is in the going of an inland soul to see past the houses, past the headlands, into deep eternity. That woman lived in her bedroom all her life, never left the drawing room of her house, never 
left her house at all. She wrote about 1800 poems, and they were found after her death. Nobody knew she was writing poetry, and now she is an icon. I meet her every day. You know, she is a constant companion. I cannot live without Emily Dickinson because she is seeking something I want to. So. you cannot read there because why why cannot i reach there it's not a spiritual pursuit is deeply connected with art and is deeply connected with space and time the reality i live in is transient indian philosophers uh, philosophers call it maya illusion it is transient so it is illusion now what is theater theater also is an illusion you know we create an illusion it also is transient and can you see the fun of it you know this illusion theater talks to you about that uh, reality which is an illusion so these two illusions come together and throw light on something absolutely fundamental absolutely intransient two transient realities coming together and giving you an experience of intransient the absolute if you can i have not seen it happening in theater in my life but i have seen it happening once only once only in music particularly i will not go into the details of that experience bharata has described them as ashta satvik bhavas you know and uh, well it almost happened like that so so once you know where you want to go and you have only one thing which would help you go there and that is your art you suddenly become serious about it you take it seriously you take yourself seriously and you realize that well you have something very precious and this is going to this might this might lead you to that ultimate destination and uh, i have not said it but i was made aware of it and it is in everybody's life some people become aware of it some people don't now well i started talking to many people about it particularly artists like musicians and like i talked to suresh ji you must invite suresh ji you know he's a very profound person he's a very profound person and uh, Suresh ji is not only a great percussionist; he's a great philosopher also. He has a lot of things to tell you about space, time, and eternity. Anyway, since I was talking to all of this, you know, I will. It is very necessary. Vade vade jayate tatva bodha. Yes, I must tell you this. I might often quote from Marathi or Sanskrit because I think in Marathi, even my pauses are Marathi. i do not speak uh, in english because when i speak english i am not sure of my prepositions and my hyphens and my semicolons so uh, allow me to lift something from our sanskrit te- texts or scriptures because it's pure knowledge you know things have become so difficult now if you quote something from sanskrit scriptures you are immediately put into the right wingers you know i am not a right winger please i announce it publicly i am khan market so but uh, knowledge is you know about religion knowledge has no religion it's about re- knowledge art humanity compassion they are about religion they have nothing to do with religion so forget that aspect but i will quote from sanskrit because it is deep knowledge and anyway it is so ancient it all happened even before we were branded as hindus so as uh, uh, i have told you that i am going to lead you into an arena er- 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 which uh, you might find very interesting but please listen to me carefully because where do i uh, go and share these things if not here because how many times do you meet like minded people who are um, tolerant and uh, sympathetic all the world okay a moment came in my life after vaada chiri bandi bai i became sort of successful my name was known even beyond maharashtra they started calling me pan indian 
then uh, nagpurians went overboard and say he's internationally known i said when did it when did it happen <laughs> you know i don't know any internationally known indian actors those who are all they live in new york they don't live in india you know rajdeep and i pause don't live here but well that is their way of showing affection and we are always in a hurry to enthrone mediocrity you know because we have nothing uh, major happening in our lives uh i became sort of famous and uh, interviews some awards and all that and uh, the joy that came with the awards and of course the purse also was transient you know it lasted for an hour or two my neighbors forgot it the next minute i stayed with that joy for a couple of hours and after that i said why is what and i realized that all this happening you know all these things happening and nothing to do with my internal life there is no connection between these achievements and they are called achievements because you are compelled by the society by your parents to achieve something you have to be achiever i said where am i i wanted to be a loser and now i am achieving and it has not made me happy at all my mind was full of unhappiness angst paranoia my mind was sick because i had adjusted myself with a profoundly sick society i had lost my innocence i had lost my nobodyness you know i was somebody when i was a nobody well it was a very happy life and what's happening to me in then another thing it had started corrupting me also i i was becoming jealous i was becoming greedy i wanted this i wanted that and i cried within myself and i did not get something i suddenly became very acquisitive and i suddenly said my god this is not good i was a pretty healthy person you know it was but then i was gradually maybe losing my what not exactly sanity but my priorities are changing and then i met rohinitai bhate she was a great friend i was in pune in 2000 and we became friends and uh if you know you know her she was a great kathak dancer she knew both the garanas banaras and uh, uh, jaipur but more than that she was a great Uh, sanskrit scholar a very erudite person a very deep person and sort of low key so we used to meet often we used to have talks again like my talks with vijay bhai suddenly she would come up with a one brief sentence and it illuminated you you know experience speaks that all has happened so we were together once and i said baby, baby we used to call her baby tai baby tai you have been dancing for the last 60 years and i asked her a juvenile question i said uh, have you reached your destination and she casually said well i never wanted to go anywhere those words thundered on me thundered on by years and i came home and i realized that my god i wanted to go to so many destinations and they were such petty small destinations and what what does it mean that person not wanting to go anywhere but doing her job with total concentration have i lost on something precious and i said mahesh you have not lost, uh, lost on something be better be i mean uh, aware uh, that you might be on a totally wrong track of course these things will come and of course these things are most welcome they enrich your material life and one should live a full material life i mean these are joyous moments in one's life people love you respect you and they give you awards and recognition that should be respected no doubt about that but if one is stuck there then that is the end of your search you must be thinking what i am doing with space and time i am coming coming back to that when that happened um 
I found myself on a different path, and I that, that was almost the time when theater was sort of uh, not becoming a top priority for me. I was sort of disillusioned. Things were changing, and I also was sort of um, not exactly in a rejection mode, but almost in the same mode which because the people could not come together, spend time together, rehearse together, their priorities were different. So I was losing interest. And anyway, as a creative artist, uh, it wasn't really meeting my demands, you know. And I was making very heavy demands on myself and my art as a writer. That's why I turned to essays. And my essays are not um, essays in the regular sense of the word. They are bel sort of. They are they are very surreal, like Duryodhan and uh, Ophelia and uh, a character from my play meet on the beach of Elburn, Melbourne and talk together about what not. I mean that kind of a thing. That was an effort to reach the unknown. We live unknown. Uh, we live uh, mundane lives. We live absolutely. Uh, lives occupied by nitty gritties and yet there is something which is beckoning you all the time and how do you do it with the help of your art and uh, in essays I tried to create my own reality where I brought all the spaces I know and all the times I know together. I took uh, characters from mythology, literature, I even had uh, the Yakshi of Didar Ganji. She's a famous sculpture, you know. You go to Patna, you see it. I mean, if you want to see how beautiful a woman can be, that is the ideal, that's the Indian ideal of a beautiful woman. It is a sculpture, but she took life and she came on the beach in Melbourne, and I, I was sitting there, and Kamu came. And Mandakini, my girlfriend, came and we were having a blast and we were talking about. Then Emily joined us later on and she recited a couple of that kind of a thing. So it was my space. All the times and all the spaces were together. And I was doing it because I was hoping that I would be able to transcend the barriers of this. Mandakini, Emily Dickinson, Didar Ganjki, Yakshi, Kamu, Mahesh El Kunjar, they are all talking about eternity in oblique ways, you know, in opaque ways. But with that one particular thing in focus. And I didn't succeed, obviously. So what's happening, I said. Oh, I have only 15 minutes. We started five minutes later. OK. <laughs> and uh, I said, I will have to reorganize my life. I have to declutter my life. I have to declutter my mind also. And uh, I really have to know what things are for what they are. At a point, I realized that when I approach a beautiful thing, you know, my perception again gets limited because I am bound by time and space and the conditionings of 5,000 years, you know. I am told what is beautiful. It is genetic, you know. I said that is, and secondly, our understanding and appreciation is beauty on a very uh, sensory level. I said, that is not right if beauty is a principle. And Keats talks about beauty in his um, Ode to Grace and Earth. You know, beauty is always truth, and truth is always beauty. And till that time, I think it was a banal line written by a great poet. But it is not banal. Because I suddenly realized, when I was reading a Marathi text by Santa Eknath, there is a beautiful um, couplet. I'll recite it for you. Dekhane, dekhije, dekhane ni, dekhane ho ni sarvangi. I'll translate it for you. The being, your being has to be beautiful to experience beautiful, beautifully. 
Got it? Your being has to be beautiful, which means clean, which means devoid of any conditionings, which means devoid of any spirit of acquisition, which means devoid of anything, Ardi. Your being has to be beautiful to experience, not to know, not to understand. To experience beautiful, beautifully. Eknath was talking about the absolute, eternity. If you want to understand eternity, ex uh, not experience eternity, not understand. You have to be like eternity, which means your mind has to be completely free of everything. So free of everything that there is no mind. So forget about eternity, but I realized what beauty is and how it has to be experienced. I began to read Emily and I began to read Eliot differently. And Eliot, when I was reading his criticism, he said, why do people want to understand a poem? It is a cerebral activity. They should experience it, you know. A poetry, good poetry, communicates before it is understood. And you all know this happens. You listen to a concert by Kumarji and suddenly you know you are sharing it. Although you don't understand the technique or grammar of it. Somehow we have, uh, the modern civilization has placed great, great uh, uh, burden on our intellects and we have been told to interpret everything intellectually. It is really not necessary when it comes to life. Now what is eternity? Well, all right, if I want to join eternity, and how do I go there as an artist and as a human being when there is, um, I'm shackled by time and space, and uh, suddenly baby time again came to my rescue. She said, why do you bother, Mahesh? Do what you are doing with concentration. Don't think of anything else. I didn't understand it. I came home. I can went back to Emily, 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 what can I do? <laughs> and she came to my sucker. She said, do it now means, what, what, why are you bothered about eternity? Eternity is composed of nows. There is no past. Sorry, I'm so sorry. There is no past, there is no future. I, I'm using my theater voice. I, can you hear me without this? There is no past, there is no future. Again, it is a structure of your mind. We never live in the nows, you know. We are always thinking about our broken, uh, um, you know, love affairs and this and that and how I was cheated and oh, well, well, I got this award and I was that memories or future. I'm going to do this. This is going to happen. We are never, you know, it's like a season. It's cutting your uh, being, future and past. We never live in the present. Baby, I was telling it to me, you know. If you are an artist, go on working, completely absorbed, with total integrity, total concentration. Why bother? It might happen to you, it mightn't happen to you, eternity thing, but you have to live in town. And Emily says it. Eternity is many nouns, innumerable nouns. Once you realize it, that at least momentarily when you are working, and this is your experience also, you don't know it. If you are working concentratedly on something, well, you are not available. Your mind is completely, you know, your mind also disappears. Your being bec becomes one with the thing. I have seen this woman working like this. You know, Bai came over to Nagpur and we were chatting together up till 11, 11.30. And said, let's go to bed. I went to bed. I got up at 2.30 to get a bottle of water from a reparation. and this woman was working in a room. I said, what's happening? Go to bed. He said, no, no, that is enough sleep for me. She was completely, she was, didn't even, wasn't even aware that I had put on the light. She was doing this, I said, what kind of a woman, you know, a workaholic. But now I understand. When she's working, she is not available for anybody, anything, not to herself even, I guess. So I've seen people like this. Uh, I have to, I mean, wind up. Because, uh, this can go on for another two hours, but well. When uh, 
you realize this that the nowness is the important thing nowness uh, delivers you from the tyranny of time and space um uh, that is a sort of what a reassurance that uh, may be one of these days you would experience understand i mean physicists are understanding it physicists tell us i have been reading a lot of physics physics lately and physics is sheer poetry sheer poetry since there is no god to interfere you know <laughs> physics is pure poetry and they tell us there are eleven dimensions we are no only three dimensions or if you take time four dimensions but there there are eleven dimensions and eleventh dimension is the one where nobody has been able to even think about you know what's happening there people may call it god but again god is our mental construct and that is when I'm, i have a teacher in nagpur and uh, i often go to him i mean i studied at his feet for a very long time darshanas six darshanas and i suddenly went to him and said uh, he is not anymore i mean he is no more and he is he never allowed me to tell his name to anybody he was a very completely withdrawn person not known even to his neighbors so at that time i went to him and said guru ji i know what is purnam idam purnam madh purnat purnam mudachyate you know it's it is from kathopanishad the very first lok of kathopanishad kathop not kathopanishad isavasya upanishad isavasya is only 18th shlok and they are enough for your lifetime i said i know now it is complete and complete out of complete and yet the complete remains complete is full and fullness has appeared and yet the fullness remains full and how true it is you know because our concept of life is so homocentric we think that we are life around us is well semi life all those tigers that are being killed every day in tadoba beyond our planet well we don't even think about it but what is that it's life you know billions of billions and billions of uh, galaxies and beyond that there is something unmanifested everything manifested unmanifested this is all an expression of the eternity and it's all going back and we know it is perishable even the galaxies are perishable all these things have come from that and will be going back to that it, and still it remains complete suddenly you know it's, it's a sort of not illumination i am not so great but i mean i was reassured and uh, this was a sort of point where i came and i began to be friendly with space and time that surrounded me because art had told me to to be in the now and uh, it also showed me that it is un- it is possible that a moment might come when you are completely unshackled that is why many artists uh, prefer to live in solitude you know they live in solitude because they do not gaiton day for instance the great painter mogubai dondutai kulkarni they are big names and they live in total solitude completely dedicated to their nows completely dedicated to their nows and there is again emily you know the soul selects her own company and shuts the door to the divine majority present no more the soul is not present for anybody so i mean i have I mean, this is only half of what i was going to say but it's almost 11:29 and i i am sure that kwasar is somewhere there you know looking at me angrily so i'll stop here i don't really know what i have offer you whether you has it has been acceptable to you or not but well um as a friend of mine told me that you have a savage confidence it's not savage confidence but i am not afraid of making mistakes you know i am not afraid of failures kya hoga hasenge hasne do what difference does it make to me it's not so big a failure is in fact a very respectful thing you know it means that you are doing something which is rather difficult to do so that is uh, all that i can offer you at the moment and uh, 
this is a very solitary journey i have wanted to come back i will talk to, more to you about beckett also and then finish it give me another 3 minutes you can see all these thing happening in beckett you know beckett was in a continuous search of silence and he realized that he has to declutter his material he wrote plays and they became smaller and smaller in duration like waiting for godo is about 2 hours i guess and then gradually he used to cut down in even his dialogue you know and finally he came to the great play breath which ran only for 35 seconds you do you know the history of that play it ran only for 35 seconds he had abbreviated his material so much because he was trying to find silence now there are two ways of looking at it the western way and indian way the westerners like susan sontag has written extensively about it and she says the western uh, particularly after the world war 2 the western artist became nihilistic and he began to ne negate everything he began to negate life he began to negate art he began to negate himself he wanted to retire into silence he didn't find it and then a lot of artist committed suicide the later part of 20th century is full of artists committing suicide zweig and kostler and silvia plath so many rambo ran he started writing at age of 16 and stopped at 18 and went to abyssinia and died there van gogh put the barrel of his gun on his forehead you know his complete negation is rather nihilistic while the indian mind responds with differently you know we are told by our shastras and i am not quoting shastras because i am very worshipful of shastras i reject them if i don't they don't um, what should i say uh, support what i am thinking about you know i am the master <laughs> there are parts of gita that are not acceptable to me but i understand urdhva mul madhas shakam ashvattam praurayam ravem chandaam syasya parnani astam vedas vedavit yeah our roots of existence are there out up there and we are just branches the manifestation of that totally acceptable it's a massively cosmic image is full of cosmic images like tagore said it you know akatari pran take pralay dolai dolati chai so many things so this is something which has been enriching me as a person i have not traveled much on this path but Uh, I am just 83. I have another 17 years to go, so I am very hopeful that would come. I mean, I would go nearer the destination. But I have been told by Rohini Tai that you don't bother about destination; you keep working. So I think I will keep working. Thank you so much for being so patient. Thank you so much for listening to me.